Aquesta segona taula, anomenada Economia Circular, com allargar la vida dels teus dispositius, us volem presentar els projectes legislatius en l'àmbit de la Unió Europea vinculat al dret a reparar i a l'economia circular. En aquesta taula parlarem de diferents iniciatives, tant en l'àmbit governamental com també d'entitats, per tal d'impulsar el que anomenem la reparabilitat dels aparells i desafiar l'obsolescència programada. El debat el moderarà la Susana, la Susana Prozakova, arquitecta amb enfocament sobre l'economia circular. Bones dies, Susana. I també representant de... Què tal? Bones dies, com estàs? Todo bien, ¿qué tal por aquí? Es muy interesante la, la charla antes. Muy bien, muchas gracias Susana por moderar también esta, esta mesa um, y de verdad que, que estamos contentas de tenerte con nosotras también conectada aquí. Te paso la palabra uh, para que, para que nos, nos presentes este panel uh, y también a, a sus panelistas. Susana, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias igualmente por la introducción. Eh, si os parece, pasaré a inglés porque tenemos unos ponentes que, que también bueno, hablan uh, varios idiomas, así lo hacemos un poquito más cercano a todos. Eh, so, uh, Recordar, Susana, perdón que, ¿sí? te, que te corte un momento, que es importante que, que las personas que se acaban de conectar a este panel que sepan que, que disponemos de, de una traducción eh, simultánea en, en varios idiomas. Eh, y que la bolita, digamos, que, que indica uh, que esto es posible está justo abajo de nuestras, de nuestras pantallas, solo para, para indicar esto, porque a lo mejor hay alguien que se acaba de, que se acaba de conectar. Susana, decir también, aprovecho que, que te he cortado para decir eh, que, que, no, que te conectas desde, desde esta entidad eh, eslovaca que fomenta la reparabilidad de, productas, de productos, eh, Reparabili, ¿sí? Y ahora sí, Susana, te paso la palabra. Perfecto, gracias. Adelante. Uh, yes, so, uh, well, I would like to switch to English just, uh, just because of our uh, uh, speakers that we have in the today's talk, which is called uh, Circular Economy or How to Extend the Life of Our Devices. Uh, it has been uh, a year that, that brought a lot of different uh, changes and different happenings that were related to, to this topic. Uh, we are all uh, here related to, to a specific characteristic of the product, which is called uh, repairability. And it's, it's a word that uh, hasn't been really used uh, till quite recently. Uh, however, in the, in the last year, especially, many uh, things happen also in the regulation. Uh, and that's why uh, we would like to share with you uh, what, what are these news. In many cases, these are very good news, or at least, uh, or, or mainly, that this topic now is being really discussed and it's finding its place uh, in the definitions of the circular economy, being actually at the innermost circle, uh, which means that it's, it's, a, it's a characteristic or it is a, a tool that makes the highest impact possible within, uh, within the circular economy. Uh, and relating it to the previous panel, uh, it decreases the, well, very efficiently the production of waste. Uh, so uh, today we will have three speakers, uh, Chloe Mikolajczak from uh, European Right to Repair campaign. Uh, he, she's actually a leader of this campaign. Uh, Leticia Vasser, uh, I hope I have read properly your name. Leticia, then please correct me, uh, uh, from HOP. Uh, Halb Obsolescence Pro Programme uh, from France. Uh, and then we have uh, David Franquesa from E-Reuse, e uh, uh, who is our local colleague, let's say from, uh, from Catalonia, Spain. Uh, so they will be presenting us um, the three different topics related to, to the repairability and to the actual state uh, of, of, of that and legislation in Europe. Uh, the first speaker, Chloe, uh, her, her speech is called The Future of the Rights to Repair in Europe, Opportunities <laughs> and Challenges of uh, Ambitious Leg Legislation. And I would like to uh, tell you something, something about Chloe before she starts to speak. 
Uh, we have known each other since quite some long time because we were been we have been uh, collaborating in the uh, rights to repair campaign. Uh, Chloe, she's an environmental justice activist and campaigner for the right to repair European campaign since its launch in 2019. Prior to this, uh, Chloe volunteered for fashion, fashion Revolution in Belgium and created the Green Seeds Project, a sustainability education initiative for high school students. So Chloe, a very experienced campaigner, uh, please go ahead and, and start your presentation. Hi, Susanna. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really, really happy to share about what's happening at EU level. I'm going to share my screen. Just let me know when you can see it, because uh, I never know. <laughs> I'm never really sure. Um, OK. Can you see it? We can. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I'll put it in full screen then. OK. Okay, so yeah, today I'll try to tell you a bit about what's happening at the European level when it comes to repair and specifically the right to repair. Um, but prior to what's happening, I would just like to tell you a few words about the right to repair campaign. So the right to repair campaign is a fairly young campaign. Um, I'll give you a bit of insight on who our members are and, and um, how many members we have. But first, I just wanted to highlight the three pillars of the campaign. So the three things that we are advocating for at European level, but also across Europe. The first one, um, well, actually that's the next slide. So first, the reason why we exist is of course, and I'm sure as many of you know, because electronics products have a high environmental footprint from raw materials to the energy used. Um, studies have shown that for small electronic products, such as a smartphone, for instance, up to 72% of its climate impact occurs before the consumers even has it in their hands. So it really is the manufacturing stage that has the highest environmental impact. So that's where we um, also um, need to act. And the second bit is we um, believe that therefore we need to keep products in use for as long as possible to reduce the need to make more that would have this high environmental footprint. Um, and this is why we need the right to repair both from a sustainability point of view, but also for consumers, because all the recent studies have shown that um, repairing your product and extending the lifespan of product can save up to a few hundred euros, depending of course on the type of product, but also for how long you reuse it. So it's not only a sustainability environmental issue, it's also very much a consumer issue. So we were launched in September, 2019. So we are a fairly young campaign, uh, about a year and a half now. And we now have 46 members in 16 European countries. And when I say European, it's because we have members in Norway and in the UK, which are not EU anymore. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting, the mix of members that we have, because of course we have repair networks. So community repair cafes, for instance, but we also have professional repairers. We have spare parts distributors, but we also have environmental NGOs. We have academics, we have CETEM, for instance, who's a member of the campaign. Uh, Hop, who's gonna, uh, Leticia, who's gonna speak after, is also a member of the campaign. And Ereuse, the third speaker, is also a member of the campaign. So I think it really shows the diversity of membership um, that we have um, and what we are trying to achieve. So there we go, the three pillars that we are advocating for. Um, the first one is good design. We believe that at the design stage, products should already be invented, should be thought in a way that they are built to last and be repaired when needed. So typical example is good design means no glue that would make it impossible to discard a product, for instance. That's a very concrete example. Then we also want fair access um, to, to repair. So that means that we want it to be accessible, but also affordable. Um, because we know that price is one of the main, if not the main barrier for a lot of consumers to repair their products. Of course, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to uh, get your stuff repaired if that costs almost as much as buying a new product. And then we want informed consumers. So that's the third pillar. We want consumers to be able to choose the most repairable product at the point of purchase. Um, so the campaign was started in a context of European policies, young, very young European policies related to repair. So the first one would be the eco-design repair requirement, which is the second block here. So in 2018, the European Commission started thinking about implementing the first ever repair requirements, which 
literally just came into force about two months ago on the 1st of March. And these repair requirements only apply to four categories of products, which are washing machine, dishwashers, TVs, and I keep forgetting the fourth one. Um, but so these are fairly limited, but it, it's still a great step because it's the first time that there were ever repair regulation at the European level. Then there was a new commission and as part of their European Green Deal, which is the sustainability strategy, one of the main pillar is what they call the Circular Economy Action Plan, which they released last year, right before um, the beginning of the pandemic. And in this plan, we campaigned so that it would include the right to repair, because before that, the European Commission never mentioned right to repair. And they did, they committed to right to repair, and they also committed to regulating smartphones, which is a great first step because smartphones had never been regulated at European level. And now, and I, I use this one as an example, there's quite a lot of new policies that are being developed at European level, which could potentially tackle um, the issue of repair. It's also in the context of a lot of support from the European Parliament. So in case um, some of you are not familiar with the way things work at European level, the European Commission proposes the law and then it is being debated between the European Parliament and the European Council and then a decision is made. But right now what's happening is that the Council and the European Parliament, they're being very vocal to support ambitious um, initiatives related to repair. So last year there were two votes in the European so Parliament sure. where they said that they uh, really supported the European right to repair, they supported uh, EU uh, repair score, they supported access to spare parts for everyone. So now what does this mean is that the ball is in the camp of the European Commission and now it's up to the Commission to propose some ambitious law. So it's been a great year, but that also means that concretely there is no real regulation still about repair at European level. So what's happening now? Um, what's happening now is that there's, an, there's a, a policy stream which is called eco-design, which is very, very important because this is where repairability requirements, um, notably related to products, are being discussed. These, uh, this is the policy stream that was used for the recent regulation on the four products that I mentioned. So now they're being discussed, uh, smartphones and laptops are being discussed as part of this eco-design process, which is great. Um, it, we should be very happy about this. But at the same time, and I'll, I'll show it in the next slide, it's problematic that only these two products are currently being discussed. Because of course- hey, Chloe, sorry to interrupt you just a second, but we are just viewing <laughs> the first slide of your presentation. So I think there is- Oh, you are, okay. Um, okay. Hold on. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. I'll just put it back into your full screen mode. Um, so the reason why this is problematic, that it's only um, uh, smartphones and laptops currently being regulated, is that what we want as a campaign is a universal right to repair. And that means that we want these regulations to apply to way more products than just six because it doesn't make any sense if it just applies to six but also universal in the sense that what these regulations include such as access to spare parts and repair information um, this should be available not only to professional repairs but also to community repair initiatives such as repair cafes but also to consumers like you and i because otherwise it really restricts the possibility of repair to professionals. It keeps telling me that my sharing is paused. <laughs> That's weird. Can you still see it? Uh, yes, we can see, but the it's, it's now the slide eight, right? Uh, which, which says what happens now? Uh, what needs to happen now? Okay, this is really weird. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why. I think we keep seeing the not full screen. Okay, this is really odd. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start sharing again and then you can let me know and I'm not going to put it in full screen. Can you see it now? Now, yes, perfect. Okay, I'm going to... What happens now? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I'll try and then if it stops again, I'll, I'll start again. Um, so it's not universal. This is what I was trying to say. These regulations at the moment, they're not universal, which is a problem, of course. Then they are talking about investigating an EU scoring system, which is also problematic uh, because they have been doing studies for years. Um, and there is, I mean, Leticia will, tell, will talk about the French repair index. And we believe that a European version could have a lot of impact as well, because of course, then it would apply to all the EU markets. And currently it's just being discussed. And then 
They are talking about investigating different ways to do policies in different initiatives. One is called the Circular Electronics Initiative and the other one is called the Sustainable Products Initiative, which means that right now there isn't anything concrete. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. There's a lot of consultations, there's a lot of discussions, there's a lot of communication, but there's very little concrete regulation related to repair. So what needs to happen now, um, a lot, obviously, but we believe that we need eco-design rules to cover a lot more products than just smartphones and laptops, because this is very limiting. And we believe that these rules should imply universal access. And this is what I was saying in the beginning. It's just that if you develop repair regulation, but it only applies to professionals and it includes community repair and it includes third party repair and it includes co consumers, then obviously that is a problem because you can't claim to have right to repair regulation if they're only for professionals. Then we believe that we need a European wide repair score. That's what I was um, saying earlier. We've seen the French index. It's a great example. And we believe that now this should be brought at the European level and they are currently discussing this. So we hope that we might be able to see something in the next few years. And then there's also some issues that are currently not being, not really being addressed um, at the European level, which is obviously problematic. And two of these issues are pricing, but also the issue of software. And as I was saying, pricing is obviously one of the main problem, right? Uh, up to 30% of consumers say that they don't want to get the stuff repaired because it's too expensive. And there are ways to address um, the price of the repair. Um, in Austria, they have implemented tax breaks and fiscal incentives so that repair would cost less money um, in france in the european why in the uh, french repair index there is a criteria about the price of spare parts so the higher the price of spare parts the lower the the end grade will be so there are different ways you can put a maximum price of spare parts you can calculate the price of spare parts depending on the price of the product but this really needs to be addressed because otherwise you may make um um, access to spare parts and repair information as uh, available as possible to a lot of people. If the spare parts are still extremely expensive because the market is controlled by manufacturers, then it won't really change, you know, at the end of the day. And another issue that uh, we believe the European Union should lean into is the issue of software. And that comes in twofold. The first one is that um, we believe that software should be extended, software updates and security updates, because if they're not, you may end up with a perfectly functioning piece of hardware, but if it's not protected anymore, then what do you do with it, you know, at the end of the day? And then there's the problem that software, we see that more and more, is currently being used as a barrier to physical so to physical repair. And I'm going to give you the example of the, the iPhone 12, which is very worrying. What's happening is that some manufacturers, and in this case, Apple, are pairing some parts, specific parts of a product, to a specific product, via using the software and obviously this means that the only people that are going to be able to remove and replace the parts and still have a functioning device will be authorized repairs so in that case apple authorized repairs so that excludes completely third-party repair it includes community repair and it includes consumers and this is actually very dangerous and yesterday we were having we were hosting a webinar with some people from the european commission and some repairers um, and they were saying that this is one of the biggest threats that they see in the future is the use of software to prevent repair. The challenges, um, so there's a lot happening at European level, uh, obviously, and um, we will do a lot of campaigning this year, mainly on the issue related to battery, on the issue related to smartphone, on the issue related to software. And the key challenges, I would say, is of course, the fact that what's happening at the EU level is always very slow. The fact, the second challenge is the fact that um, at the end of the day, a lot of the decisions that are taken at the EU level depend on the national level, right, the countries. So if some countries are very against some measures, then no matter how ambitious the proposal was, it's going to get blocked. And what we are seeing is that some countries are really supportive of such measures. Some countries are way less supportive of such measures. And so this is why I'm going to show it in the, the next slide, which is the final one. We need a lot of support also at national level. We need people to mobilize as well. We need people to tell their governments that these regulations need to happen, mainly at, EU, at European level. Um, because at the end of the day, when it's gonna go through the council, we can't have countries that are gonna block. And in some countries, it's actually even 
worst is that in Germany, for instance, the um, environment ministry is very much in favor of strong, ambitious regulation. The problem is the minister that is responsible of what's happening at EU level is the economic ministry uh, in Germany. And them, they are not so <laughs> keen on having ambitious measures, let's put it that way. And then of course, um, the third challenge, which is probably the biggest one, is the pushback from manufacturer. Um, at European level, which is also true at national level, but particularly at European level, there's a lot of lobbying from industry. There's a lot of meetings happening behind closed doors. There's a lot of untransparency. Um, and we know that last year it was all the announcements. So uh, the EU was announcing that it was going to do a lot of things, but there wasn't anything concrete. This year, this is when the technical discussion are happening. So we do expect a lot of pushback from the industry, uh, but we're ready to expose them. We're ready to explain what's happening and, and say where they are pushing back. But um, yeah, these are, these are, I'd say, the main challenges that we are currently facing in pushing for ambitious freight repair regulation. Um, and as always, if you want to get involved in the campaign, if you are an organization that is related to repair, um, or if you know anyone, or just as an individual, if you, if you want to get involved as well, feel free to reach out. Uh, as I was saying, we need as many people as possible to show that we are a strong movement in Europe, but also across the world, and that these regulations need to happen. And just a final word maybe is that, why is it so important to push for regulations at European level? It's because the European market is one of the largest in the world. So everyone wants to sell in Europe. Um, and so when there are regulations that are taken at European level, it affects all the member states. And we believe that this would have a huge impact on the global market as well, because manufacturers aren't going to make a repairable product for Europe and then a non-repairable product for the rest of the world. It wouldn't make any sense. So this is why it's so important that we have harmonized legislation across the European countries so that it, it's so big that it doesn't make any sense anymore for manufacturers to do two streams of products. So I think that's everything. Um, thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Chloe. Uh, well, for the questions, please uh, write them also to the chat uh, because we will come to all the questions at the end uh, of, the, uh, of the three presentations. Uh, so uh, now we will speak about the repeatability score in France. Actually, Chloe already mentioned that this is one of the uh, main achievements of the, let's say, repairability in Europe. Uh, and it will be uh, Leticia from HOPE uh, who will explain us um, what happened and what they have achieved. Uh, so Leticia is a general delegate and co-founder of the association HOPE, uh, how the obsolescence programme. Uh, she has worked as a parliamentary assistant in the Senate, then as a consultant and teacher. Uh, Leticia was a member of the ACT Committee for the Minister of Ecological Transition, and she also is the author of the book. Um, well, uh, Leticia, could you please say it in, in, Fran in French, because I think I would just not say it right. <laughs> ah, you're, you are muted. Les jetables durables en finir avec l'obsolescence programmée. Oh, sounds wonderful. And I would be never able to say it. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so please go ahead with your presentation. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much for this invitation. I am very glad to be here uh, in, uh, in Catalonia speaking about this uh, topic with you. So um, uh, yeah, I, I will um, continue the, the great um, uh, talk of, uh, of Chloe, as we are also part of this uh, coalition, um, to talk about what happened in France uh, right now. Um, and the first, maybe to present what is HOP, uh, the French Association Against Plant Obsolescence. So um, it's a mobilization for durability. We really want to extend the lifespan of products. And uh, we uh, mobilize right now around 60,000 um, 60,000 people um, and we are we create the association in 2015 so um, the main goal is to extend the lifespan of product and we have three main ways to make it 
uh, first of all, um, mobilization of people to show that consumer wants products that uh, last longer, but also um, lobbying. So the good part of the lobbying, I hope so, uh, trying to defend the interest of consumer um, in front of uh, manufacturer in general uh, for the law to get better law. And uh, also uh, we work with the company themselves to show that uh, as it's an economic topic, we also can have um, a company that are engaged in a positive way and show that it's possible to make it differently. So we also have a, a website in English, uh, as I, I put here, uh, then you can maybe uh, understand better what is uh, around, but also we have also the French website. So I hope I can, do you see the next uh, slide? Yeah. So just to remind you, there is three types of obsolescence for us and it's what we try to tackle. First, uh, technical obsolescence, or like uh, Chloe said, if something is glue or, or you can't uh, repair or you can't access you or it's break very easily, uh, or there is like a chip in, um, in a printer to make it uh, uh, that you will uh, the ink will be uh, uh, not uh, available even if there is still ink in the machine but you have to buy a new one because of this chip uh, in the machine for example this is kind of technical obsolescence but like chloe said there is a lot of software obsolescence now that increase a lot with all these connected objects and um, this is a very big topic uh, around uh, uh, when you download um, um, and a new iOS of your phone and finally it make it uh, worse than doesn't work so well or you, you some uh, manufacturers try to um, to um, another reparation of a product uh, is not possible because the manufacturer detect with the software that it was not made by uh, their own company and they you can't uh, you can't uh, make the 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 device work again after this reparation by an independent one. So um, this is very problematic. And uh, also the psychological or aesthetical or cultural obsolescence. Um, this is more about marketing, advertising, all this pressure, uh, social pressure about changing uh, your product that even if they are still working uh, to be fashion. And um, yeah, you have to know that planned obsolescence is a crime in France since uh, 2015. I was working before in the French Senate and I, I play a, a role in this to, to make it as a crime and it helped people now to, uh, to engage uh, against this uh, practice of manufacturers and to remind to the manufacturers that it should not uh, be uh, okay to make a planned obsolescence. But we also need to go further and and not just about plan obsolescence, but increase the lifespan of product in general. So that's why now we also talk about premature obsolescence, as it's not like a legal crime. Just some example that we tackle, tackle in France, like smartphone, printers, washing machine. We make a report uh, to really of investigation to really understand why there is problem. And sometimes we in the society or organization like us, or maybe in um, in the repair coalition, we are we don't have enough data about products. What is not working enough? It's very technical. So we are trying to make this report. And uh, sometimes when we have enough uh, elements, we make lawsuit in France as it's possible, like in um, against Epson for printers or for Apple. And we already, already get some sanction. Uh, Apple um, had to pay 25, um, 25 million of uh, uh, euros for, um, for the kind of uh, plant obsolescence uh, because of this uh, iOS uh, problem that makes the smartphone doesn't work so well after you download it. So we, thanks to all this action and the mobilization, we get some uh, good uh, progress in France, like the repairability index. So I will try to explain a little bit what is it and what are the limits of it for now. 
So it's a tool to improve uh, repairability and we are really glad that we got it because it's important and it's already in the um, online and in the, um, in the shop uh, for few products like TV, computer, washing machine, mower and smartphone. And uh, soon we hope that it also will be in for vacuum tablet or pressure washer, uh, pressure washer also. And um, for the five first product I said, it's already in the shop since uh, January. Uh, and uh, the second products I said will be more uh, in 2022. And step by step, it will extend to different kinds of products. And um, it has been a, a long process uh, working with the uh, government with manufacturer, um, sellers, iron reparator to make uh, this um, board that you see here with a uh, different criteria like documentation, uh, the capacity of uh, removable uh, or, or to reassemble, uh, reassemble, <laughs> sorry, it's a bit difficult to say for me, but like uh, to make it again together, right? And it has to be easy to do. And also the, the price of the spare piece, uh, like, uh, like Chloe said, is really important. So, so we are happy we got it in this, uh, in this index. And uh, sometimes there, and there is like a criteria specific on different products because you can't uh, address like a TV, like a mower in the same way. So like, for example, for computer, laptop, you have a specific criteria on software. Uh, but uh, these criteria are, are very well i think it was a very good job and we we got a lot of uh, good appreciation of it but uh, sometimes it's not enough so it's like it's like a first step and we hope that we we can um, we can also um, download this board and uh, have a better version in the future and specifically for logistical part um and also for the point is that you for example, if you have a good documentation, you have a lot of points. But if uh, you can't even open the machine, you get that point. But you still have uh, like a note, uh, uh, maybe average note uh, of the index. So we need to make uh, a good balance with what is really important to get uh, the priority. And that this uh, you can have, that will have a very big impact of the final grade. Otherwise, you give a, a fake image of what is a repairable product. So this is the kind of limits that we, we try to, um, to uh, upgrade and to, uh, to, to push. Because of course, in front of us, we have manufacturers who say, no, it's perfect like this. Or um, if uh, we repair in our own services, it's OK. We, we do the best we can. But no, you don't do the best you can. If you the best for a, a product that would be repairable is that if everyone can repair it himself, because you have the tools standard that you can buy in a normal shop that it's not so expensive, you can open easily, and the price of the spare piece is easy and it's it's not so expensive and easy to find. So, and this uh, uh, index is quiet goes in this direction. You will have more point if it's open to everyone to repair. And this was really important for us, but still uh, it can be uh, improved. Um, and especially also about transparency because this board I show you, uh, it's what the client can ask to the seller that the manufacturer had to give to the seller uh, to explain how he gets this final grade. But um, even if it's a good step, it's not sufficient for us. Because for example, uh, if you go to this category of the criteria that we give you the information about the delivery delay, uh, if you need a spare piece, you ask for it and uh, you will have a delivery delay if it's uh, two days or three weeks or one year, uh, it will change a lot your capacity of uh, repair this product. And um, then the manufacturer put himself a note, a grade, but uh, for you as a consumer, you see a grade and you don't know what it means. Does it mean two days, three weeks or, or one year? What, what means seven to 10, you know? So this um, detail is not uh, given to the consumer. So it's uh, quite a problematic to really understand 
how uh, the manuf manufacturer calculates his note and the response uh, engagement that uh, the compromise he, he have uh, towards consumer. So it's this kind of thing that we want to improve. And I would like to share a good news with you is that for us, the uh, index of operability is very interesting, but it's a, really the a first step. The revolution will come with a durability index. Uh, but first, before to, to talk about this uh, revolution, just wanted to, to ask that, to add something uh, that we, we also get in France, and thanks to my uh, association, is it in 2022, so next year, we will also have a repair found. Because like say Chloe, uh, sometimes maybe you can repair, but uh, you, if you want to see a, a professional reparator, it can cost a lot and, and specifically uh, regarding the price of the new products that sometimes can be really cheap. So we get a repair fund. It means that the, the manufacturers will have to pay a little contribution and this money will be collected in like in a pot and we redistribute to the reparator and uh, then the reparator will make like a discount uh, for the final consumer to repair their, their objects. So we are really happy to get that because it's a very, uh, it was a very big obstacle and uh, we, we are quite optimistic about this fund to make also increase the reparation and help people to access uh, these uh, good practices. And then uh, in 2024, like I said, the durability index that is really, really important for, for me uh, because we finally will uh, have information not only about the product is repairable, but also about the robustness and the scalability. So to really know if the product should last also longer and before to, uh, to see the first failure that you will have to repair if it's repairable. So that is a very uh, good news and we hope that this also will, uh, will uh, be extended in Europe. And to go further and to finish, um, yeah, we have some recommendation uh, that we, as we are doing lobbying also, uh, citizen lobbying, like to extend this French label on uh, as a mandatory uh, label uh, for about lifetimes, uh, lifetimes products uh, in Europe, uh, and also to implement a usage meter. Like for the, for example, for the car, we have a usage meter. We know how many kilometers we did with this car. How, why don't we know about the uh, hours we spend on the, on the laptop or the cycle we did with the wash machine during uh, the, the life of this product to have more transparency, maybe also to help us to, to do a better maintenance. Uh, right to repair, so we are happy that uh, Chloe works for us in Europe and, and uh, we think it's really important. And um, also maybe to uh, increase the warranty and the, prote the protection uh, about the digital uh, uh, obsolescence and uh, to control advertising because I think it's really problematic that we have like um, this uh, sp global speech of um, help us uh, to uh, go in the circular economy, uh, repair your products, uh, um, make the good choice. But in another hand, buy buy uh, always more, and uh, black mark, black uh, Black Friday is open, and and this um, this um, logic is not compatible with a sustainable future. Um, yeah, just to finish, I wanted to to show you a good practices also of uh, power of consumer with this platform we made in France. And uh, we give uh, uh, consumer tools to, to buy uh, uh, products that will last longer, how to make them last longer uh, with uh, some, some tools and to repair it easily to uh, make the warranty effective. Uh, so uh, yeah, this uh, also give a brand and ranking to the brand, to the brand of, uh, of companies to know if they are repairable or not. And uh, this is like a pressure for consumer uh, towards companies to make them improve. And it works as we have now uh, 20, more than 20 companies that are voluntary to uh, en engage themselves in the durability to show that it's possible to give products and services that last or contribute to this durability. And it have an impact when we talk about 
uh, as a hub, as an NGO, but we also have companies that follow this movement of durability. Um, it's also uh, good to, to have this, uh, this network of company uh, in France and in Europe. So I, I will be happy to answer your question and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Leticia. Uh, well, it uh, sounds a bit funny, but I think hope gives hope to the whole Europe <laughs> uh, together. Well, with, of course, the, all the movement that has been done in France. Thank you very much for that. There have been already some questions, but let's leave them uh, for the end of the conversation. Uh, you can see them also in the chat. Uh, so you were also speaking about uh, another very important property of the products that actually has to go together with the repairability, which is the durability. Uh, because one without another uh, doesn't make uh, sense or it's not enough, let's say, to keep our products longer. And this is the topic that uh, David Franquesa from eReuse will, will present us. Um, uh, how we can measure the durability of our devices is the topic. Uh, David, bienvenido. Ya lo, ya lo vemos ahí en la cámara. Uh, pasamos a <clears throat> castellano en este caso. Eh, bueno, ojalá catalán, pero bueno, a, a lo mejor en alguna próxima charla. Eh, David es experto mm -hmm. en, en reuse y, y los eh, digital devices. Ha, ha fundado uh, varios proyectos. Eh, la tecnología para todos, Technology for Everyone, uh, The Reuse UPC Program, uh, reuse.org y Pang Pangea Circuit eh, y también otros. Eh, David eh, ayuda a las compañías y gobiernos para reducir su, su consumción o su uso de um, <coughs> devices. Bueno, eh, aquí me cuesta la traducción de, 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 de inglés. Eh, y lo están haciendo mediante el reuso de estos equipos eh, y en colaboración de, de compañías o, eh, sí, eh, de sociales. Entonces, eh, David, adelante con tu presentación. Muchas uh, gracias, Susana, por la, la introducción. Gracias, Setem, por considerar nuestra ponencia de interés uh, para el Congreso. Como decía Susana, formo parte de la Federación IRIUS, es una red de reparadores y distribuidores de equipos de segunda mano. Son entidades pequeñas que tienen entre 1 y 10 trabajadores, ¿no? son entidades de barrio ¿no? y muchas entidades en, son entidades sin ánimo de lucro. Y Rillus forma parte de la, de la organización Right to Repair que Euro, Europe, que ha presentado Chloe, por lo que de la misma manera pedimos el derecho a la reparación. Y al igual que HOP, la organización que ha presentado Leticia, Queremos poder consumir productos que no sean obsoletos, productos que sean durables. También soy investigador de la Universidad Politécnica de Cataluña ¿no? y en el grupo de investigación trabajamos a cómo medir la durabilidad de nuestros dispositivos. Y hoy estoy aquí ¿no? a, con el objetivo de, de presentaros a este sistema, esta metodología de cálculo, con la que hemos recogido más de 8.000 observaciones ¿no? de un total de 500 modelos y cada mes que pasa se va incrementando. Así que os gustaría saber cuándo va a durar el dispositivo portátil, móvil, tablet, con, con lo que sea que estéis mirando esta presentación, pues uh, vamos a ello. ¿Cómo es la tecnología de una nave espacial? Esta es la nave Orion, se lanzó en el espacio a finales del 2014. A bordo tenía tres ordenadores del año 2002, algo de la prehistoria. ¿no? Entonces, quizá algún tipo de restricción presupuestaria. ¿no? no, pues no. El programa Orion se financió con más de 1.200 millones de dólares. ¿no? Entonces, ¿qué era? Pues que priorizaron la fiabilidad a la velocidad de los dispositivos. Querían dispositivos que pudieran estar operativos durante horas, incluso años, sin fallar. En el 1966, el economista británico Kenneth Boulding publicó 
a la economía de la próxima nave espacial Tierra. En este ensayo, en este ensayo, Golding utilizaba la metáfora de la nave espacial Tierra para enfatizar los límites del planeta, del planeta, tanto en la extracción de recursos como en la capacidad de asimilación de residuos que generamos. También dijo, cualquiera que crea que el crecimiento exponencial puede continuar para siempre en un mundo finito, ¿es un loco o un economista? ¿Por qué no vemos a nuestro mundo, a nuestro planeta, como una nave espacial, en donde usamos nuestros finitos recursos infinitas veces? Esta, ¿Esto es lo que quieren los consumidores? ¿Los consumidores europeos del mundo van a preferir fiabilidad, reparabilidad, durabilidad a velocidad? ¿No? Pues bueno, me siento optimista al respecto. ¿no? Hace, ya, hace ya unos años que llegamos al pico de la innovación de los dispositivos digitales. Un, un pico en la innovación, por ejemplo, de un teléfono móvil significa que las funcionalidades que traen los nuevos modelos ya no dejan um, obsoletos a, las, a los anteriores. ¿no? Quizá la cámara mejora un poco, pero, pero no es significativo para cambiarlo. Entonces, por haber pasado el pico de la innovación y porque nuestros economistas se han dado cuenta de que un crecimiento exponencial en un mundo finito no es posible, Ah, quizá prospere esta idea, ¿no? pero hay que, preguntarlo, hay que preguntarlo a los consumidores. ¿no? Y cuando preguntamos a los consumidores ah, qué es lo que piden ¿no? ah, de un teléfono acerca de la, del tiempo de vida, pues tenemos estas dos encuestas. En la primera ah, preguntan a consumidores austríacos sobre la vida útil esperada, la expected, ¿no? y sobre la real de sus teléfonos móviles. Estos esperan que duren 5,2 años, pero en realidad los dejan en el cajón a los tres. Y en la segunda encuesta preguntan a consumidores alemanes, en media esperan que les duren cuatro años y un 9% de los encuestados espera una durabilidad de más de ocho años. Hay otras um, estadísticas del Centro de Estadísticas Europeo, el Eurostat, ¿no? que han recogido que un 77% de los consumidores europeos preferiría poder reparar sus móviles a tener que cambiarlos. ¿no? Pues um, parece que los consumidores europeos hoy ¿no? valoramos más la re reparabilidad y la durabilidad a nuevas funcionalidades. ¿no? Um, y bueno, pues entonces ya está, ¿no? Ya lo tenemos, ¿no? Entonces vamos a pedir que pongan unas etiquetas en los productos para, para que esto salga, ¿no? Que salga cuánto va a durar, ¿no? Pero bueno, aquí está el problema, que no, no, es, tan, no es tan fácil, ¿no? Um, ¿Cómo podemos saber cuánto va a durar un dispositivo? No tenemos esta bola mágica que nos explique el futuro. ¿no? Bueno, aquí es cuando podemos acudir a, a célebre Einstein, ¿no? que, y cogiendo una de sus frases, ¿no? que decía, uh, si, si quieres conocer el futuro, uh, mira al pasado. Y esto es justamente lo que hace nuestro método. No, no sabemos cuánto va a durar un modelo nuevo, pero sí podemos saber cuánto han durado los modelos anteriores. ¿no? Algo es algo. Ahora entramos en unos temas un poco técnicos. Solo hay cuatro conceptos que se deben entender para, para bueno, comprender la, la, cómo medimos la durabilidad. ¿no? Y, bueno, todo dispositivo ¿no? pasa por distintas fases. ¿no? Hay el, el lanzamiento del producto, es el, la fecha de release, ¿no? cuando salió al mercado, cuando se vendió, cuando empezó a usarse, aquí ya está en manos del consumidor, 
cuando este lo descarta, se recoge, va a un centro, pongamos centro de reacondicionado de y e reuse, ¿no? después uh, se revende, se usa, se reusa, ¿no? Entra la segunda mano y pues pasan pues, vamos, cuatro años, se descarta, queda en el cajón y después llega a un centro de reciclaje que lo recoge y hace este registro ¿no? y finalmente se recicla. El primer concepto importante es la, la vida útil potencial, la potential useful lifetime, que sería el tiempo que transcurre desde el lanzamiento del producto hasta ¿no? la release date, hasta su recogida en un centro de reciclaje, de la que tenemos esta fecha de registro. Entonces, estamos de acuerdo que el tiempo de vida potencial sería de nueve años, ¿no? se fabricó en el 2013 y se recicló en el 2021. Vamos al segundo concepto. El segundo concepto es la, la vida útil, el useful lifetime. O sea, el tiempo que en realidad el dispositivo, que ha sonado antes, que quizá vuelva a sonar, está en manos del usuario. ¿vale? Que empieza en la compra y hasta que se deshace de él, dos años aquí, en este primer ciclo, o se revende, se usa de segunda mano, ¿no? y se descarta cuatro años más, en total sería seis años, ¿no? el useful lifetime. Dos conceptos más y ya está. Y esos son fáciles porque es el, el encendido y el, y el apagado. ¿no? Un dispositivo que está en manos del usuario puede estar power to on, está encendido, o power to off, está apagado. ¿no? Y la suerte que tenemos es que podemos saber las horas que un dispositivo ha estado encendido. Esta información está almacenada internamente y no se puede borrar. A este valor le llamamos el BOH, Powered on Hours, es un estándar. ¿no? Y lo capturamos de manera anónima en el momento en que el dispositivo va para el reciclaje. ¿no? En este ejemplo, tenemos una lectura de 40.000 horas, o sea, que durante estos 2 más 4, en total 6 años, ha estado en manos del usuario 40.000 horas encendido. Si, si tenéis un sistema Linux, como supongo que tenéis, vamos a poner un, un Ubuntu, hay una aplicación llamada Udisks. En mi caso, yo tengo un Dell Latitude E6440 y la aplicación me dice que ha, ha estado en funcionamiento un año, cuatro meses y 15 días. Son exactamente 500 días por 24 horas y mi POH es de 12.000 horas encendido. Este modelo se lanzó en el año 2013 y aún está en funcionamiento. El Potential Useful Lifetime es mayor a 9. Y llegó a mis manos en el 2014, por lo que serían 8 años de Useful Lifetime. Pero esto es solo una observación, por lo que no podemos generalizar a que este modelo tenga estos valores. ¿no? Así que vamos a ver otro modelo del que tenemos a 200 muestras en el sistema como es el, el Acer Dariton uh, M480. ¿no? Aquí cada punto es una observación, o sea, un, un dispositivo de este modelo. ¿no? En el eje de las, de las Is tenemos el POH, el Power on Hours, y en el eje de las X los uh, años de calendario, ¿no? que si recordáis son los años transcurridos entre el, la fecha de lanzamiento del modelo y la fecha de recogida para su reciclaje definitivo. Y algunos uh, datos interesantes es, por ejemplo, la, la media de horas que, que ha estado encendido es superior a 18.000. ¿no? La, la media de tiempo de vida potencial es de 8,2 años y hay un máximo, un dispositivo que ha durado 65.332 horas. ¿no? O sea, es la electrónica de este modelo 
lo soporta. ¿no? Bueno, creo que es un buen modelo, salió bien, ¿no? y comentar que hoy aún se está reutilizando, por lo que en breve actualizaremos estos datos. Y hablando de datos... Sí. Solo un comentario, que tendríamos solo tres minutos más, no sé cómo vas, pero para, para decírtelo. Vale, gracias, Susana. Para poder generalizar la durabilidad del modelo necesitamos tener muchas observaciones de este modelo. Aquí un, un resumen de las observaciones que tenemos por marca. ¿no? En total uh, estamos observando unos 400 modelos y tenemos estas 8 más de 8.000. ¿no? A nivel de metodología... Uh, son los, los centros de reutilización federados a Use que mediante una app que es Open Source uh, recogen esta información uh, en el momento que borran los datos o hacen el reciclaje final. ¿no? Um, el Powered On Hours, las, los, las horas que ha estado hasta encendido. ¿no? Um, bueno, comentar que que cada vez hay más centros de reutilización federados a iReuse que, que colaboran, de hecho es, uh, están para intercambiar buenas prácticas um, entre, entre las entidades, compartir recursos, um, compartir herramientas, ¿no? incluso compartir dispositivos, porque hay centros que se especializan en ciertos modelos ¿no? y... Um, y compartir datos, porque la, la información uh, que os estaba explicando pues nos permite medir el tiempo de vida ¿no? potencial de un dispositivo, que viene a ser su potencial de ser reutilizado. ¿no? Y es justamente esto que el centro necesita antes de, ¿no? de, uh, de invertir tiempo reparando un equipo, saber si va a valer la pena, va a compensar. ¿no? a su tiempo ¿no? para, para sostener su actividad. ¿no? Entonces, las etiquetas del pasado nos hablaban de, de datos, uh, CPU, procesadores... Yo creo que esto ha llegado a... Ya es una commodity, como el agua, la luz, ¿no? y, el, y el presente nos habla de, de etiquetas pues, más de impacto. ¿no? Um, es 100% reutilizado, calidad asegurada, ¿no? de reacondicionado, a materiales reciclados, cero carbón um, y respeto a los derechos humanos en la cadena de, de, de producción, ¿no? incluso materias primeras. ¿no? Y en el futuro, ¿por qué no? ¿Por qué no imaginar um, poder saber las horas ¿no? que ha estado, uh, que puede llegar a durar eh, encendido ¿no? o, o estar disponible a manos ¿no? de los usuarios? Entonces, a, bueno, a nivel de call to action, si, si sois reparadores y distribuidores de equipos de segunda mano, os invitamos a uniros a la red. Si sois una administración pública a, o una empresa, a tratar de comprar productos que sean durables y reparables. A, no solo pense, pensar en la garantía, ¿no? porque si un equipo con una larga garantía, a no es reparable, cuando llegue al centro de reutilización, eso no se podrá reutilizar, irá directo al reciclaje. ¿no? Entonces, um, y, y también pensar en, en la compra de, de segunda mano, ¿no? porque un equipo de segunda mano es muy fiable, ha estado funcionando 10.000 horas antes, ¿no? no va a fallar, ¿no? como la nave de Orion. ¿no? Y a las organizaciones de consumidores, pues... Bueno, estos datos son abiertos, uh, la metodología se publica y el software es open, así que ¿por qué no uh, colaborar y recoger más datos ¿no? para llegar aquí? Y uh, bueno, y así ya, ya termino. Uh, me, me, me gustaría ¿no? que, que haya, si hay preguntas al respecto... Ah, se ha intentado explicar ¿no? cómo, cómo medir la, la, la durabilidad, ah, de, qué, de qué manera ¿no? recogemos estos datos y, y el poder que estos datos pueden ah, tener a manos del consumidor, ¿no? que cuando compre un producto no sabrá cuánto va a durar, pero, pero puede premiar a los fabricantes que en el pasado... ¿no? A, han hecho productos a, más durables. ¿no? Yo creo que esto es un, puede 
generar un gran cambio sistémico. ¿no? Um, y bueno, uh, y esto es todo y, y muchas gracias por vuestra atención. Muchas gracias, David, que bueno, es muy interesante. Yo creo que no, no sería mucho para hablar una horita sobre este tema también. Espero que habrán preguntas. Eh, tenemos muy poquito tiempo, de hecho, a esta hora ya hubiéramos tenido que acabar con todo. Eh, pero bueno, yo creo que ha sido un tiempo usado muy, muy útil. Eh, vamos a ver las preguntas que están en el, en el chat. Eh, pues eh, veo una para Leticia. Uh, Leticia, uh, I will switch to English now. Uh, we have a question here uh, from Judith from Setem. Uh, who controls that the index uh, that companies give to themselves is real and the and the criteria are met? Uh, this was, I suppose, to um, the part where you were explaining the uh, the repairability score, right? Uh, we cannot hear you for some reason. Also, also you are unmuted. Not yet. Now, do you can you listen? Right. Um, so it's a good question. Um, I I try to write a, a first answer in the in the chat. It's actually an index that uh, the manufacturer have to complete themselves. Um, um, the grid that is given by the government and it's well detailed and they can't do what they want um, and uh, there, there is still fine kind of interpretation but it's quite well done and they they have agreed that they have to to um, to give the answer and uh, this will calculate the final grade after uh, what happened when they give this information it's a control of um, maybe first of all the companies themselves that will compare and uh, if uh, they see that they are uh, concur um, in the competition uh, they they find uh, uh, the con uh, concurrence um, uh, who write a very good grant and the great and they don't understand and they think it's uh, false they will maybe be the first one to say what what did you say it's false but then uh, the state also has the power to control um, and to um, they will not control all product for sure but uh, they they have this power to control some of them and and to give sanction administrative sanction uh, with financial sanction also and uh, of course we try to make a, a good role also in this and we we are um, uh, working on a french uh, coalition for reparation and especially to control this index with partners of reparation and, soci and civil society to make also this independent control uh, to make the pressure uh, to be sure that the, the grade will be realistic uh, because uh, of course it's a very big challenge and I completely agree with uh, a remark uh, and, and uh, someone said about the marketing and uh, like I said this is part of cultural obsolescence and we also have to tackle it uh, strongly. Thank you very much. And I am sorry to say but I, I have to, to quit uh, very soon this uh, conference because I am uh, attended in another one but uh, thank you very much for the for the for this um, chat and I am uh, very available, available by email if you have uh, any question or anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, I think also we will have to conclude just very soon, but there is one last question that would be interesting to respond. Uh, and it, it is when we will have the index of, reper of, of durability here. Here, I suppose, means uh, in Spain or in, uh, uh, in Europe in general. So, so maybe to let uh, Chloe or David uh, respond also, if you if you would like to comment on this very shortly, uh, and we can conclude this uh, conversation with this maybe a bit futuristic, hopefully not too futuristic vision. Well, there was an article not too long ago in Spanish press uh, about saying that the Spanish government was investigating a repair index. So. Who knows? Um, at EU level, if anything happens, um, it won't be before 2022, 2023 at the 
earliest and that's being ambitious um, because it would need to go through different streams and they would need to choose if they want to do this product by product or on a horizontal basis which is very unlikely um, so yeah at European level at least not before at least two years I would say thank you uh, David would you like to add something sobre el, el índice de reparabilidad, acabo de, de mandar un, un enlace al chat con una consulta pública ¿no? que finaliza a finales de mayo, así que es momento para aportar. Y en, a nivel de durabilidad ha salido una recomendación europea a cómo medir la durabilidad en teléfonos móviles y a mediados del, de este año se trabajará a nivel de laptops, ¿no? Así que, bueno, se está trabajando en ello. Fantástico. Yo creo que esto es una, una muy buena noticia para los que han preguntado y todos nosotros también. O sea, eso confirma un poco la tendencia que vemos en Europa, uh, que en Francia están más adelantados con este tema, uh, y que, pero hay actividad también en otros países, que luego, si, si veis en el repair.eu, Um, bueno, salen las noticias de los países que, que también pues, están participando en estas iniciativas. Uh, entonces, bueno, de nuevo, muchas gracias a todos. Many thanks to all. Uh, I think there has been a lot of uh, interesting information. We, are, we all are uh, very happy to respond to any other questions uh, and be in touch. So, well, many thanks also to SETEM for organizing this whole Congress and putting the, the, the focus to the environmental and social topics as well. Thank you. And nice to see you, David, Chloe, and Leticia. Moltes gràcies, Susana. Moltes gràcies a aquest, a aquest segon panell que, de fet, ens ha fet ens ha, d'alguna manera, ens ha animat, ens ha animat perquè ha estat com una taula enfocada a, a les solucions una mica, no? hem vist a persones que estan eh, lluitant no? per aquest dret a, a la reparació, hem posat una mica d'esperança sobre què podem fer també amb els nostres residus, però eh, també per posar consciència en com, en com consumim la CLOE de European Right to Repair Campaign, el dret a reparar, ens ha presentat eh, les iniciatives de productes sostenibles també, hem parlat de normes d'ecodisseny no? i ens ha posat aquest punt no? que de vegades se'ns oblida um, perquè no estem potser eh, ben informats o informades sobre aquesta utilització del software uh, per impedir la, la reparació i ens hem posat també el dia de les regulacions que, que, que estan, per les que estan lluitant persones com la Chloe no? en aquest uh, marc europeu, uh, regulacions que incloguin també els reparadors, reparadores i també els consumidors i consumidores des de França, des de França a la Leticia de Hop, doncs ens ha, ens ha animat molt també per, per això, per acabar amb l'obsolescència programada. Tenen moltíssimes iniciatives, ens ha fet posar llum també aquests diferents tipus d'obsolescència, la tècnica, la del software, i recordar-vos, que ja sé que totes les persones que participeu ha estat prenent apunts, però recordar-vos que Hop ha portat també a, a, a Epson i a Apple a judici per pràctiques d'obsolescència programada. Moltíssimes gràcies uh, per la feina i també hem passat per, per entitats uh, de, de barri també, no? amb, amb el David Franquès, amb Irre Lluç, um, persones que, que, estan, que estan molt al dia, que són activistes també pel dret a la, a la reparació i que estan en aquesta mateixa línia de, evidentment, extendre a la vida dels, dels productes. Ara farem 15 minuts de, de pausa, ens hi tornarem a posar d'aquí 15 minuts a les, 12, a les 12 i quart. No us desconnecteu, si us plau, simplement eh, si voleu apagueu les, eh, les vostres càmeres sí? eh, i els vostres àudios també. I entre tant projectarem un vídeo molt curtet que s'ha produït per, a través de Satem Catalunya aquest últim any que mostra eh, els impactes de, de la Covid eh, a les dones treballadores de la Índia, un vídeo que forma part d'una trilogia de peces eh, titulada eh, com l'edició d'enguany eh, del Mobile Social Congress sense cobertura. Posem el vídeo.
அம்மா அப்பா ரொம்ப கஷ்டப்பட்டு எங்களை வளர்த்தாங்க ஏன்னா அப்பா வந்து சின்ன வயசுல ஆக்சிடென்ட் ஆனதால அம்மா தான் வீட்டு வேலை செஞ்சு காப்பாற்றினாங்க எனக்கு அப்புறம் ஒரு மூணு பேர் இருக்காங்க தம்பி ஒருத்தர் ஒரு தங்கச்சி ரெண்டு தம்பி இருக்காங்க ஸோ அவங்களுக்கு முன்னாடி நான் தான் இருக்கின்றனால நான் டென்த்தோடையே படிப்பு முடிச்சுட்டு அப்போவே கம்பெனியில் பசங்க கிட்ட கேட்டு கம்பெனியில் போய் ஜாயின் பண்ணிட்டேன் திருச்சியிலேருந்து நான் வரேன் எனக்கு ஃபேமிலி பேக்ரவுண்ட்ஸில் என்னோடய எய்மே வேறு நான் டிப்ளமோ தான் முடித்தேன் என்னோடய எய்மே வேறு பட் ஆனால் ஃபேமிலி பேக்ரவுண்ட்ஸ்க்காக தான் நான் இந்த கம்பெனிக்கு வந்து ஜாயின் பண்ணேன் ஜாயின் பண்ணி சரி அக்காவுக்கு அண்ணாவுக்கும் மேரேஜ் ஆகிடுச்சு கொஞ்சம் கடன் பிரச்சனைக்காக தான் நான் இங்கே வந்து ஒர்க் பண்ணிகிட்டு இருந்தேன் லாக்டவுன் அப்போ எனக்கு ரொம்ப பிரச்சனைகள் வந்துச்சு இங்கேருந்து பஸ்ஸுக்கு வீட்டுக்கு போகிறதுக்கு அமௌண்ட் எதுவுமே இல்லை நாங்கள் வந்து கேட்டோம் இப்போ ஸ்டார்டிங்கில் ஹெவியாக இருந்ததுனால ஒரு ஒன் மந்த் ஒன்றரை மாதம் லீவ் விட்டானுங்க அதுக்கப்புறம் பார்த்திங்கன்னா நம்ம லோக்கல் இருக்க ஆளுங்க கம்பல்சரி வந்து தான் ஆகணும் ஏன்னா வெளியில் இருக்கவங்க பாதி பேர் ஊருக்கு போய் ஆகிடுச்சு ஊருக்கு போனதால் இங்கே இருக்கவங்க வந்து தான் ஆகணும் அப்படின்னு சொல்லிட்டு நாங்கள் இங்கே ஸ்ரீ பம்பத்தில் நான் ரூம் எடுத்ததால் இங்கே கண்டிப்பாக நீங்கள் வந்து ஆகணும்னு சொல்லிட்டு அப்படிங்கிற மாதிரி அவங்க ரொம்ப ஃபீல் பண்ணாங்க ஆனால் இவங்க வந்து எல்லாமே ஃபெசிலிஸ்ட் நாங்களே கொடுக்குறோம் அப்படின்னு சொல்லிட்டு தான் கூட்டிகிட்டு வந்தாங்க ஏன்னா இங்கே வந்த ஒட்டியுமே நாங்கள் பதினஞ்சுலாம் வந்து தனிமைப்படுத்தி வச்சு தான் நாங்கள் ஹாஸ்டல் மூலியமாக தனிமைப்படுத்தி வச்சுட்டு அதுக்கப்புறம் தான் நாங்கள் கம்பெனிக்கு கலப் பண்ணுவோம் அப்படின்னு சொன்னாங்க ஒரு டூ டேஸ் மட்டும் தான் ரெஸ்ட் எடுக்க விட்டாங்க அதுக்கப்புறம் நீங்கள் உடனே வாங்க அப்படின்னு சொல்லிட்டாங்க எப்பயும் நார்மலாக இருக்கிற மாதிரி தான் ரன் பண்ணிகிட்ருக்காங்க சார் கம்பெனியை அதே மாதிரி பார்த்தீங்கன்னா இப்போ கொரோனா இஷ்யூ போயிட்டுருக்குன்னு சொல்லிட்டு டெம்பரேச்சர் செக் பண்ணுறது அந்த மாதிரி பிளட் செக் எதுவுமே உள்ள கிடையாது சும்மா நார்மலாக சானிடைசர் போட்டுட்டு நீங்கள் எப்போ போல் உள்ளே கண்டினியூ பண்ணுங்கள் அப்படின்னு சொல்லி உள்ளே அலோவ் பண்ணிட்டானுங்க இந்த கொரோனான்றதால் கொஞ்சம் கேப் இட்டு இது பண்ணுறது அந்த மாதிரி எந்த ஒரு இதுவுமே ஸ்டேஜில் மாறல எல்லாமே அப்படி தான் இஷ்யூவில் எப்போவுமே போகிற மாதிரி தான் போயிட்டு இருந்தது அவங்களுக்கு தேவை ப்ரொடக்ஷன் ரன் ஆகும் அவ்வளோதான் அதுதான் பார்த்தாங்க இல்லை எல்லா கம்பெனி பொறுத்த வரைக்கும் டெம்பரேச்சர் செக் பண்ணிவிட்டு சொல்லிட்டு தான் எல்லாருமே உள்ளார் போவாங்க இங்கே அப்படி கிடையாது டக்குன்னு உள்ளார் போயிட்டு லைனில் போய் ஒர்க் பண்ணணும் அப்படிங்கிற மாதிரி தான் எல்லா இதுலேயுமே வந்து ஹேண்ட் வாஷ்லாம் கொடுப்பாங்க பட் ஆனால் இங்கே எந்த ஒரு ஷேப்பும் கிடையாது ஒர்க் லோடு ஹெவியாக இருந்ததுன்னா எதனாலன்னா பாதி பேர் ஊருக்கு போயிட்டாங்க ஸோ அதனால எங்களுக்கு ரொம்ப ஹெவியாக இருந்தது லோடு அதுவும் இல்லாமல் அந்த டைம் தான் அவங்க வந்து தண்ணி தான் கம்பல்சரி பண்ணி ஆகணும் அப்படின்ட்டு மெயினாக பார்த்திங்கன்னா உள்ளே வந்து ஸ்டேஜுக்கு ரெஸ்ட் ரூம் போகிறதுக்கு மெயினாக கஷ்டமாக இருக்கு நான் ஆல்ரெடி உங்களுக்கு சொல்லியிருந்தேன் ஸோ என் ஸ்டேஜில் நான் ஒரு ஆள் பார்க்குறதுக்கு இன்னொரு ஆள் போட்டாங்கன்னா அவங்க நான் மா ஆள் மாற்றியால் அந்த ஸ்டேஜுக்கு செய்யறது கம்ஃபர்டபுளாக இருக்கும் ரெஸ்ட் ரூம் போகிறதோ இல்லை லஞ்சுக்கோ எதுவாக இருந்தாலும் கம்ஃபர்டபுளாக ரொம்ப கம்ஃபர்டபுளாக இருக்கும் ஃபீல் பண்ணுறேன் செகண்ட் பார்த்திங்கன்னா வந்து ஃபுட்டு இப்போ வர வர ரொம்ப நல்லா இல்லை ஏன்னா கொரோனா டைமில் அப்போ வந்து பொடிஷன் கம்மியாக ஆகிடுச்சு ஏன்னா கொ கொரோனா டைமில் வந்து நிறைய பொடிஷன் ஜாஸ்தியாக வாங்கணும் அப்படிங்கிறதுக்காக ரொம்ப ப்ரெஷர் பண்ண ஆரம்பிச்சிட்டாங்க பிள்ளைங்களை போட்டு ரொம்ப டார்ச்சர் பண்ணி ஆரம்பிச்சுட்டு இப்படி பசங்க வராத இடத்துக்கு மேன் பவர் விடுறதுல எல்லாமே ஷேரிங் பண்ணி தான் ஒர்க் பண்ணணும் அப்படிங்கிற மாதிரி ரொம்ப ப்ரெஷர் கொடுக்க ஆரம்பிச்சிட்டாங்க சார் மூணாவது பார்த்திங்கன்னா குழந்தைங்களை கூட்டிகிட்டு போனோம் ஏன்னா எங்கள மாதிரி மேரேஜ் ஆனாங்க எல்லாருக்குமே வந்து குழந்தைங்க இருக்குது ஸோ சைல்டு பார்த்துக்கிட்ட உள்ளே ஸ்ட்ரெஸ் குழந்தைங்களை பார்த்துக்கிற ஸ்ட்ரெஸ் மாதிரி எதனால் ரெடி பண்ணாங்கன்னா ரொம்பவே நல்லாயிருக்கும் அதுக்குன்னு தனி ஒரு உமன்ஸ் ரெண்டு மூணு உமன்ஸ் போட்டு குழந்தைங்க பார்த்துக்கிற மாதிரி பண்ணாங்கன்னா ரொம்பவே கம்ஃபர்டபுளாக இருக்கும் என்ன மாதிரி நிறைய பேர் கஷ்டத்தில் இருக்கவங்க நிறைய பேர் வர ஆரம்பிப்பாங்க ஓகே இந்த கம்பில் குழந்தைய பார்த்துக்கிறது இருக்குது ஸோ நம்ம போ குழந்தையும் பார்த்துப்போம் ஃபேமிலியும் பார்த்துப்போம்னு சொல்லி நிறைய பேர் வர ஆரம்பிப்பாங்க இந்த எலக்ட்ரானிக்ஸ் மேனுஃபேக்சரிங் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி இன் தமிழ்நாடு தெர் இஸ் அன் ஆக்டிவ் ஸ்ட்ராட்டஜி இன் ஃபேக்ட் டு ஹையர் யங் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஜெனரேஷன் ஒர்க்கர்ஸ் வித் லிமிடெட் நாலேஜ் ஆஃப் தேர் ரைட்ஸ் அண்ட் என்டர்டைன்மெண்ட்ஸ் the real reason is that young women in a place like tamil nadu uh, tend to be docile and much less likely to voice grievances before uh, what's often a male dominated management we see factories that employ over 6000 workers over 90% of whom are female they don't pro- provide creche or child care uh, facilities despite there being very clear requirements in the law it is very important that public buyers decision makers and consumers are conscious of the responsibility of our electronic consumption and